and we look in the book Education, it says, Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for His children. Godliness, Godlikeness, is the goal to be reached. Before the student, there is opened a path of continual progress. He has an object to achieve, a standard to attain. That includes everything good and pure and noble. He will advance as fast and as far as possible in every branch of true knowledge, but his efforts will be directed to objects as much higher than mere selfish and temporal interests as the heavens are higher than the earth. We see that God has a plan for us that is higher than we can even think of ourselves. And so in order to have something that is beyond our possibility to attain or to think of, what, what, what must we do in order to grasp that if it's beyond our capabilities to even imagine? It means that we must then have the mind of Christ, that we must take on a new way of thinking, a new way of looking at things so that we can then attain it. It must be higher than mere selfishness, mere temporal interests. So we must then look beyond what we can see physically to what we can see spiritually, through the eyesight, the mind of Christ, as we are told in Paul's writings, we must have that let that mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And let's see, I have a story to share with you to illustrate this idea. There was once an eagle. It was just, it had many little baby eagles in the nest, but one day one of those eagles fell from the nest onto the ground and it was not able to find its mother again, but a farmer came along and found the baby eagle and rescued it from any of its predators because while eagles, when they're grown, they don't have predators, baby eagles certainly would. That's why their nests are so high up in the trees if you've ever... I don't know if you have eagles here. Do you have eagles? Maybe you have, maybe you have parrots and they have high nests as well. Yes, maybe? Or what's a tall bird, but eagles build their nests very high on the top of trees, usually that are in a solitary place. But this eagle, the baby, fell out of his nest and was not able to get back. So the farmer came and rescued it, and the farmer had chickens. So the farmer put him in the chicken coop with the chickens, where it, it was safe from any of the foxes or the animals that were around that might uh, want to have it for dinner. So, what do you think, how do you think that this eagle was raised? Do you think he was raised how? Did he, like a chicken, right? And so he went around scratching the dirt and pecking at the little worms and he kept looking around and eating those things. But you know, one day, um, he, he looked up into the sky and what did you think he saw? He saw an eagle soaring above and he said, wow, if only I could fly like that. Do you think the eagle was able to fly like that? The eagle had all of the right body parts. He had the strong wings and he had the, the, all of the parts that are for an eagle. He could have been that bird of prey to swoop down. He had the claws that were meant for that sort of life. But do you think that he ever flew? No, because he never knew that he had the capability of that. He thought that he was just like the chickens. And so he stayed in the coop. But you know, God wants not that for us. He wants something better. He knows that he has prepared you. He has made you in his image. And we find that in Genesis that we were created in His image. And He has high ideals and expectations. But you know, this world has fallen and it's in a different pattern. And as we look around, our minds are not in the same after sin as they were before. So we look around and we only come up to the standards that we see around us. And this is why God said to have no other gods be before Him because He knew if we looked around us, then we wouldn't raise to our full potential. So what is God's plan? 
what is his plan for how, what does the soaring like the eagles look like for us? As we are not eagles, we're humans. Well, let us look. It says in Genesis chapter 2, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and the Lord God took the man and put him in Eden to dress and to keep it. Now, was this before sin or after sin? This was before sin, exactly. God planted a garden, and if he did it before, was that then perfect? Yes, that was the perfect place for man for his highest development. So let's look and see. The purpose before? In education of the man. The system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all uh, of for all after time as an illustration of its principles a model school what was Eden a model school was established in Eden the home of our first parents the Garden of Eden was the schoolroom nature was what the lesson book the Creator himself was what the instructor, the teacher, and the parents and the families were what? The students. So we have, even before sin, the Lord had a plan of educating us. Now let's look at the true object of education. It says that it is to restore what? The image of God in our soul. So at first, before sin, the image of God was there, but it was to be developed. And after sin, when it was removed, it must now be restored. So this is the purpose. In the beginning, God created man in his own likeness. He endowed him with noble qualities. His mind was well balanced and all the powers of his being were harmonious. But the fall and its effects have perverted these gifts. Sin has marred and well nigh obliterated the image of God in man. It was to restore this that the plan of salvation was devised and a life of probation was granted to man. What is probation? It's a time period of proving. When someone has gone to jail, they are put on probation to see whether or not they have changed their ways. So we are now on a time of probation to see if we are worthy to be trusted, if we can follow, if we will obey God and His ways, or whether we will be uh, someone who will raise up like a mutiny, as the enemy did. So this was to bring him back to the perfection in which he was first created, is the great object of life. So here we are, you're in a family, you have uh, maybe lots of plans of your own and lots of objects, but what does God say the great object of life is for each one? Restoring the image of God, restoring and proving whether we will trust God, whether we are trustworthy and we will trust God with our lives. So while we may have temporal views, while we may have selfish ambitions for this life here on earth, God has a big picture that He wants us to see. And until we see this big picture and we trust that His ways are the best and He has a good plan for us, we will not be on board with His plan for education or any of the other things. So we must purpose in our hearts, first of all, that we would like to be on board with His plan for our lives and on the same purpose and object of life, which is primarily to what? Restore the image of God in His creatures, in us. And we finish. This object is the, to underline every other. It is the work of parents and teachers in the education of the youth to cooperate with the divine purpose, and in so doing they are laborers together with God. Now let's look at the purpose before sin. God gave to our first parents the means of true education when He instructed them to till the soil and to care for the garden home. That was before sin. After sin came in though, disobedience, through disobedience to the Lord's requirements, the work to be done in cultivating the ground was greatly multiplied for the earth be because 
of the curse brought forth. It brought forth weeds and thistles, but the employment itself was not given because of sin. The great master himself blessed the work of tilling the soil. So we see that even before there was uh, any kind of disruption, God had a plan for us to be in the ground and tilling the soil and producing and working and, and making a garden a beautiful place to dress and to keep it. But afterwards, Adam and Eve had chosen the knowledge of evil, and if they ever regained the position that they had lost, they must regain it under what? Unfavorable conditions that they had brought upon themselves. No longer were they to dwell in Eden, for in its perfection it could not teach them the lessons which it was now essential for them to learn. In unutterable sadness they bade farewell to their beautiful surroundings and went forth to dwell upon the earth where rested the curse of sin. So. Did God take him out of the garden because he was angry or mad at them or he wanted to punish them? Is that why he took them out and gave them the curse of the sin to, to have to learn? Tell me, is God angry and is that why he's making us work in the sweating and hot? No, he is not angry, but he knows that there are lessons that we must learn that we cannot learn anywhere else, in any other way. So why did God choose a garden to be our first teacher? And this, we're going to have four points, and I'm going to challenge you to remember them so that we can retain them. And our first point is none other than, say it with me, Useful occupation. Okay, say it with me again. Ready? Useful occupation. Thank you. So that's the first reason why God chose the garden. And you know, He chose the garden even... He chose for useful occupation to bless us even before sin. So we know that it's a blessing to us. It, it develops our highest powers. And we see again in the book Education, page 21, to Adam and Eve was committed the care of the garden, to dress and to keep it. Though rich in all the owner of the universe could supply, they were not to be idle. You know, sometimes we think that we have arrived at the, the highest place that a human can arrive to when we no longer have to work, when we can rest and be idle. But even Adam and Eve, when they were the sons of the, the king of the universe, they were not to be idle. So what about us, the princes and princesses of his kingdom? Neither we. Useful occupation was appointed them as a blessing to what? Strengthen the mind. What's the second one? To, ex to strengthen the body, I'm sorry. To expand the mind. And three, to develop the character. So these are three important points that the Lord knows that we need in order to develop ourselves completely, to reach that higher than the human thought can attain, is to first to strengthen what? The body. What's the second one? To expand the mind. And then to develop the character. Exactly. So these are the three areas in which true education will focus in developing our mind, our bodies physically, and our character. When we look again, we think, uh, in our human way of thinking, we think that we can rest when we are at ease, that that is the best place in life. We have arrived, but the Bible, the Lord says that the earth is to be made to give forth its strength, but without the blessing of God, it could do nothing. In the beginning, God looked upon all that he had made and pronounced it what? Very good, he said. Genesis chapter 1. The curse was brought upon the earth in consequence of what? Sin. To, but shall this curse be multiplied by increase of sin? So if we sin more, we will have more curse upon us? Ignorance is doing its baleful work. Slothful servants are increasing the evil by their lazy habits. Many are unwilling to earn their bread by the sweat of their brow, and they refuse to till the soil. 
but the earth has blessings hidden in her depths for those who have courage and will and what? Perseverance. What do we need? We need courage, will, and perseverance to gather her treasures. Fathers and mothers who possess a piece of land and comfortable home are what? The kings and queens. So we think of kings and queens as those who live in a palace, but right here in your own home, on your own land, where you can till your own soil, God sees you as a king or a queen of the highest order. And I underline the word queen because it makes me smile. Dr. Butte always refers to his wife as his queen. And that is exactly what she is, the queen of her home. And her children are in subjection under her. It's a beautiful thing when you follow God's plan. A solution for the needy. Remember, what is our title for this one? Our four points, we're on the first one. And it is? Useful labor. So this is a solution for the needy. Do you have any of poor and needy in here in the Philippines? Yes, you have plenty. We have them all over the world. But the Lord says, if the poor now crowded into the cities could find homes upon the land, they might not only earn a livelihood, but find what? Health and happiness. They could have health and happiness now unknown to them. Hard work, simple fares, close economy, often hardships and privation would be their lot. But what a blessing would be theirs in leaving the cities with its enticements to evil, its turmoil and its crime, misery and foulness for the country's quiet peace and purity. So we all are seeking for that happiness, for that restfulness for something to satisfy us and it won't be found we see in the enticements to evil the turmoils of the city the crime but in the peace of the countryside although we may have hard work and simple fare that's where we find that we will be truly happy and content and the story is told of a man who he started out working in the garden as a farmer he was the poorest of the poor and he worked but he worked diligently and he worked his life very hard persistently until he established for himself enough to buy some land this is in China and he finally got some land and he worked and he worked and he got some more until finally he developed for himself quite a little family he had one wife but after he got settled he went out and he found another wife and he brought that into her into his home and after a while he he became almost like a king in that land very rich and very you know successful in the world site but this man finally uh, he had contention in his home from his multiple wives and he had just all of the money people were stealing from him and, and taking from his things and it was just so much stress so finally he walked outside into the earth and just left everything and he went back to till the soil again and when he started to sink his hands into the earth and he found that that was where he was truly happy when he was working in the soil because he found out that all the things that the world had to offer that didn't bring him happiness because he didn't have the principles of God to guide him to use them properly but he tried everything that the world had and it only brought contention and strife but the earth he found in there a solidity because that's where God had intended us to find uh, that useful labor to find peace and contentment. And so even though he didn't know the Lord's plan, that's where he was happy. Our second point is, what is it? Creator focus. Let's say it together. Creator focus. When we uh, look at our Bible verse here. So if you eat or if you drink or if you do anything, do it to the glory of God. Now, we see 
who will be warned. It says, we say again, out of the cities, do not consider it a, greater depriva a great deprivation that you must go into the hills and mountains, but seek for that retirement where you can be alone with God to learn His will and way. When you get into the country, what do you see around you? You see trees? What else do you see? Children, what do you see? Are we in, we're a little in the country here? Look around. We see some buildings, but when you get into the country, what do you mostly see? Look at the ground. What's there? It's, what is it? What do you see on the ground? Mm, is it sand? And maybe there's some leaves. And if we looked up, we have a tarp above our heads, but what's past the tarp? the sky and there's a, even some trees there and we look around what's beyond that building there the ocean the sea and you know who made those things God but if we were in a city what would we look at if we looked under our feet we'd see cement or pavement if we looked up we would probably see power lines and buildings and skyscrapers maybe and if we look to the left and the right do you think we'd see the ocean if we were in a city no, we'd see buildings and, tr and just cars and buses and all of these things, and they're not bad in and of themselves, but where do they tend to point our mind? To people, to men's works, especially the skyscrapers, they're erected for us to look at what man has done, and they have a use, but when we are in the country, when we look around us, we are pointed to the things that God has made. And it makes it much easier for us to meditate on Him and His goodness, to focus on Him. It's a Creator-focused environment where we can be connected with our Lord. And in that retirement, we can be alone with God to learn His will and way when we are surrounded by the things that we see. Let's see, we have a warning here. What's the warning? Let's read our warning together. It is a law of the mind that it gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is trained to dwell. If occupied with commonplace matters only, it will become dwarfed and enfeebled. What does this remind you of? Our story? Like the little chicken, if he only looked around him and saw the things like the other uh, chickens, if the eagle saw the chickens around him, we adapt. It's a natural law of the mind, and we see this principle in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, But we all with open face behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord and are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now children, if I am looking at this flower, does that mean that if I look at it all day long and all night, will I start looking like a flower? No, that's not what it means. I won't start looking like a flower. What if I start looking at uh, a kitten? or a puppy, and I keep looking and I say, but they're so cute, I want to look cute like a kitten or a puppy, and I keep looking. Will I start looking like a kitten or a puppy? No, I won't start looking like a kitten or a puppy. But if my friends around me are fighting and arguing, and, and have you ever noticed that you may not have been in our argument, but maybe your brother is upset or angry, and then all of a sudden you feel kind of angry or upset yourself and and then you start getting in a fight with your brother but you weren't angry before or if your friends someone comes into the room and they're singing and they're happy and then all of a sudden you just find yourself singing and happy too that's the kind of way that we are beholding by beholding we become changed the things that we think about the things that we look at whether they are positive and uplifting we will be changed into a positive and uplifting way or whether we look at something that is negative and just looking at the rise in crime and those sorts of things it's directly associated they can see with the amount of TV that is watched whether it's negative TV uh, or just the video games that are being played those are all things that contribute to this principle by beholding we become changed but if we look at the flower how what will that help us to learn if we're looking at the things of nature, 
What do you think? It points us to God and His character. And what does every petal of the flower say? I love you. It's a message of love from God. And whenever your parents, when your child says, I love you, does that bring a frown to your face? No, it brings a smile to your face. And that way, in a way, is also enforcing those good things in our mind when we say, I love you, to each other. When we see this picture that God loves us, then it reminds us of we are special and that we want to become like Him, loving in character. So creator focused. Cut off from, the gr from great degree, from the contact with the dependence upon men, and separated from the world's corrupting maxims and customs and excitements, they would come nearer to the heart of nature. God's presence would be more real to them. Many would learn the lesson of dependence upon Him. Through nature, they would hear His voice speaking to their hearts of His peace and love, and mind and soul and body would respond to the healing and life-giving power. Healing and life-giving power are fine through meditating on the things that God has given to us. <laughs> so our third one. What were our first two? Okay, we just showed them quickly on the screen. What's our first principle? Useful labor, useful occupation, yes. What's the second one? Creator focus. And our third one is it helps us to avoid temptations. Especially as parents, we should be concerned. I'm not a parent, but you should be, and parents should be concerned, and I am concerned for the children, of putting them in the valley of temptation. If you do not want your child to fall into the corrupting habits, do not place corrupting habits before them. It's as simple as that. The danger is, it is Satan's purpose to attract men and women to where? The cities. And to gain his object, he invents every kind of what? Novelty and amusement. Every kind of excitement. And the cities of the earth today are becoming as were the cities before when? The flood. And we know what was in, what does it say that at the time of the flood, men's thoughts were? evil continually. There wasn't a good bone in them, as you would say. There wasn't anything positive to come out of those cities. And I would like to think that we're not at that place yet, that there are still good people, as it were, in the cities, and there's still good to be found. But we see that it is becoming more and more like the cities at the time of the flood. And we must protect and keep ourselves because we know the principle by beholding we become changed. So avoiding those temptations. And James tells us how to avoid them. It says, let's read it together. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will what? Flee from you. Amen. So we must close the door it would be well for you to lay by your perplexing cares and to find a retreat in the country where there is not so strong an influence to corrupt uh, the morals of the young. True, you would not be entirely free from annoyances and perplexing cares in the country, but you would there avoid many evils and close the door against a flood of temptations which threaten to overpower the minds of your children. They need employment and variety and this, the sameness of the home makes them uneasy and restless and they have fallen into the habits of mingling with the vicious lads of the town thus obtaining a street education. So we see what does it say? Does it sound like being in the country is supposed to be monotonous and boring? What does it say? That children need what? It's right in the center of our text. They need employment and variety. And we know variety is the spice of life, right? And so being in the country, they will find no end of things to keep them active and to play and to enjoy. There are so many things. Just the other day, uh, at the last place we were, 
I learned how to make a ball out of bamboo leaves, entirely out of natural material. And I said, this is amazing. There are so many things that you can learn how to do in nature. Be creative. It will make their minds uh, come alive. But also good, useful employment will be found there. There's a lot of good work that can be done in the city and uh, in the country and you will find that you will not have the free time to then become uh, that will become dangerous to you to your own so now we're going to do a, a brief case study at Abram versus Lot and do we remember this story in the Bible of yes of course it's found in Genesis chapter 12 and the first place we'll look is verses 1 through 5 and now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of the country, and from the kindred, and from thy father's house, unto the land that I will show thee. So first there was a calling out. A calling out of a place that was known and familiar to him. So he went. And God promised that I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So, Abraham departed. It was Abram. As the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. So, if you say, but I'm too old to move out of the city, well... If you're not quite 75 yet, maybe you've exceeded that, but you can still make changes. God can bless you to do that. So God, Abraham obeyed and Lot went with him. And Abram took Sarai his wife and his Lot his brother's son and all their substance and that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, that's their servants, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. So we see them going into the country. But what happened while they were there? Did the Lord bless them? Yes, He blessed them abundantly. And you know what happened? They had so much that there wasn't space enough for everyone in the area where they were. So children, do you know the story? What happened? He said that they started to fight. That Not Abraham and Lot, thankfully. They were good friends. But their servants, they said... They both had their best interest in mind and they wanted to make sure their master had the best. And they realized that there wasn't enough space. So, to avoid any strife, Abram came to Lot and said, You choose which way you want to go. And which way did Lot choose to go? He went towards Sodom and Gomorrah, which were, was that the country? No, it was the city. It was very well developed. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered, even where before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the Garden of the Lord. So it looked like basically the Garden of Eden. So it was gorgeous. So he went there and he chose to journey in that direction. And Abram, he, was he discontented that Lot got what looked better and what looked nice? No, he was... He was quite content. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent. Where did he pitch his tent? What does it say? It says that he pitched them towards Sodom. So that's not se definitely not separating himself away from it. But the men of Sodom were what? Wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Now let's look. Although Lot owed his prosperity to the connection with Abraham, he manifested no gratitude to his benefacting benefactor. Courtesy would have dictated that he yielded the choice to Abram, but instead of this, he selfishly endeavored to grasp all its advantages. He lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere and even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. So it was the most fertile and the best looking place, and it was even as beautiful as Egypt and the, the richest places, but there were cities. And this is where the trouble comes in for Lot. Wealthy and beautiful, inviting to profitable traffic in their crowded marts, 
dazzled with the visions of what? What was Lot dazzled by? By the visions of prosperity and worldly gain, Lot overlooked the moral and spiritual evils that would be encountered there. The inhabitants of the plain were sinners before the Lord exceedingly, but of this he was, ig he was ignorant, or if he was ignorant or knowing, he gave it but little, he didn't think before he went forwards into this land. And he chose that area. But how little did he foresee the terrible results of his selfish choice. So first off, in making our decisions, we must contemplate what are the factors in helping us to make a decision. Are we making them based on what God's Word says? Or are we making them based on what I feel and what I want to do and what I think would be best for me and myself and my family in a selfish way? So we have to ask ourselves, what is my motive? And if Lot had done this, then he would have spared his family um, a great loss. And we know how the story ends with Lot. Did He had many children and how many actually came out with him in the end? Two. And even their hearts were still clinging and his wife's heart was still clinging to the city life. So he could have spared the life of his entire family. And barely he himself was saved. Only because of the angels and the mercy of God. So we, we want to take a lesson from these stories and we want to follow uh, the good example of Abraham. So why, what are our, our three so far? We have three topics. Children, do you remember them? Either? What was the first one? Useful occupation or labor. What was the second one? Yes, a creator focus. And the third? Avoid temptations. Yes, very good. And our fourth one is going to be... And... Can you guess by our picture? Yes. It will promote health. Now, we see the pictures that we have on our slide. What does that make you think of? The eight laws of... Health, yes. Can you name them? Maybe you learned them in one pattern or another. If we learned them, okay, new start. What does the N represent? Nutrition. The E? Exercise. W? Water. I could use them right now. <laughs> and the S? Sunshine. And the T? Temperance. The A? Air. And R? Rest and the ex next T? Trust. Trust in God. Trust in divine power. So looking at these, we, we want to see where is the best place to get the very best out of all of these. Well, where do you think? It's in the country. And we're going to look at that more closely and prove it in case anybody would want to argue the point to many of those who living in the cities who have not a spot of green grass to set their feet upon, who year after year have looked out upon filthy courts and narrow alleys, brick walls and pavement and skies, clouded and with dust and smoke, if these could be taken to some farming district, surrounded with the green fields and the woods and the hills and brooks and clear skies and fresh pure air of the country, it would seem almost like heaven. Now we're going to look at some studies. Uh, in this first study, we see that in Asia, due to the rapid rise of myopia in Korea, a study was conducted on young school children. And you know, it's been very growing that more and more younger and younger, they need to use glasses. What's myopia? So that they can see close up. They're becoming more and more nearsighted, so they can't see a great distance. But what happened? In the study, they said the teachers uh, had all the children spend their recess time outdoors. So it was just about an hour every day mandatory after, um, after less than a year when they were compared to children from another school 
who were not sent outdoors. It wasn't mandatory, so they could go outside or they could stay inside. They were compared. And what did they find? They found a much less increase of the degeneration of their eyes in those who just spent some time, just an hour, in the sunlight. And what is the principle? I don't know if we've gone over it yet here, but what age is a good age for children to start going inside and receiving that kind of schooling education where they're more reading and learning those things? Have you learned that yet? Right around 8 to 10 years old. Because it's not just an arbitrary thing where children who aren't 8 to 10, we don't want them to learn how to read yet, we want to keep that from them. No, it's because their eyes, their bodies, their physical things are still developing. So they can start looking and, and learning and things, but to f have them to sit down and to study and read and to do those things, it's a strain and a stress on their bodies that they are not quite ready for. And we see this principle in the Bible that the sunlight is so good for the health of our eyes. In Ecclesiastes 11.7, Truly the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing is it for the eyes to behold the sun. So even before, if we would just take the words of the Lord before, we wouldn't have to have the, the children who went through the study who didn't have their eyes developed. We can learn before these things through the Word of God that it's good for our eyes to behold the sun. It brings them health. Exercise is another important factor in which being out into the country, of course you can think of lots of things, but these are just uh, some few of the diseases that are directly uh, connected with lack of exercise, with being indoors and being in a, a, either a desk job or being prolonged hours in school or sitting long times in seminars without lots of ex exercise. So it's de attention deficit disorder um, and hyperactivity, ADD, ADHD, depression, insomnia, diabetes, cancers, high cholesterol, and the list could go on and on of all of the diseases that are affected by a lack of physical exercise. And so even as you're here and we're at a family Bible camp where we get to open the Word of God so many times together, it's still important that we get lots of physical exercise. So we have even breaks where you can get up and take a walk. Thankfully, the beach is right next door to us, uh, right at our on the other side of the uh, building there. And we can get lots of physical activity. So even here, we want to remember these health principles. And then sleep. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, it says in Ecclesiastes 5.12. Uh, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. So as we work, we have a blessed sleep. And you know, an interesting study, I don't know that I have a slide here on it. Yes. Um, if we look here, light pollution and cancer. Some studies have indicated that light pollution in bigger cities, they indicate the risk factor of cancer, such as breast and prostate cancer. So something like just not sleeping in a dark room. So we know that sleeping in a dark room is important for the proper hormonal function. When we have a dark room, then the serotonin and the melatonin, that balance is then created. So it's important if we go uh, and have lots of bright lights where we're sleeping, even just having, you know, little lights around your room. It's best to try to make it as dark as possible. And where is it the darkest, the best kind of light? For sleeping, you'll find in the country where there's not the city lights, the street lights going on. Um, and also, the interesting thing is that there's never been a study that has shown that moonlight or starlight has caused any kind of cancer or been a risk factor. So we don't have to be afraid of that kind of um, light pollution. Um, but you know, the interesting thing is where there's lots of light pollution, other risk factors could be uh, also indicated or, or combining with it. So where you have lots of street lights and things, there may be other things like pollution in the air. But we ask the question, will the city give my children some advantages? And maybe we, we uh, 
say these things about Lot, like he didn't have a good choice in going into the next to the city. Maybe he had good intentions. Maybe he thought that's the place where my children can get an education or can be well surrounded by culture and get that kind of learning. But let's look at what what can we give the best inheritance better than any other inheritance of wealth you can give your children will be the gift of what? A healthy body, a sound mind, and a noble character. And we learned earlier on one of our first slides that it would tend towards uh, giving us physical strength and mental clarity and then developing our characters would be in the country. And so the very best inheritance that we can give to our children are these three things. And you know we see that oftentimes we work and work and work so that we can get ahead in life and then all that we've saved up you see the elderly then pouring their life savings into doctor's bills or those sorts of trying to regain health that they have spent through using it up in their childhood and, or in their youth and, and just pushing themselves to the max. Or um, At the Lifestyle Center where I work, I saw a young lady only in her 30s and she went to school to study and she had a goal in life, but she studied so much in her, she, her body, she didn't have regularity, that she um, stressed herself to the max where she conducted a, a fatal disease and she did die. And she, to the last, she was still planning, she was going to get well and go back to school and she was going to finish those goals and dreams. She didn't realize that those aspirations that she had actually killed her through that. So better than any other inheritance of wealth, of knowledge, of training, and those sorts of things, if you don't have your health, then you won't be able to enjoy all of the rest. And so as we're here, we want to look at those eight laws of health. Drinking plenty of water, getting plenty of good exercise, and eating the most proper food at the proper times, being temperate, and not avoiding those things that are harmful. And that doesn't mean just things like uh, nicotine or alcohol, but also those things that would compromise your immune system or just make you harder to focus as you're sitting in classes. You want to treat your body so that you can have the best health to enjoy life the most. Isn't that what we all want? What we all want for each other, for, our, for ourselves, for our children, is that health and happiness. And God tells us how we can have it. We have uh, one more example, the life of Enoch. What was the life of Enoch? Where did he live? He lived in the country, in the mountains. But where did he work? He worked in the cities. So we know that there are many people in the cities. It's a beautiful place to be able to reach because they're all together. So they're just waiting for you to come to them and give them the gospel. They're, they're hungering for something. That's why they're there. They're looking. They want to get something. So they're ready. And Enoch would go and he would share with those who were willing, who their little seed, like we learned in our lesson this morning, was prepared to sprout, so he would gather those ones and come and plant them in the country with him. But those who were not ready, who weren't willing, then he would, you know, let them, and he would himself go back. So he didn't stay in that environment that was toxic, but he would uh, separate and come back into the country. And also, we have examples um, throughout the Bible of this. And at this time, we know that it is not for the faint of heart to do this. So at this time, we cannot have a weak faith. We cannot be safe in a listless, indolent, slothful attitude. Every jot of ability is to be used and sharp, calm, deep thinking is to be done. The wisdom of any human agent is not sufficient for the planning and devising in this time. Spread every plan before God with fasting and with humbling of the soul before the Lord Jesus and commit thy way unto Him. The sure promise is He will direct thy path. He is infinite in resources. You say, how is it going to be done? How, sh how can I do it? He knows. The Holy One of Israel who calls the host of heaven by name and holds the stars of heaven in position has you individually in his keeping. 
And he has a plan specifically for how he wants to help your family to grow to the most, to the best that it can. And he knows how it can be done. And as we go to him, remember, with humility, asking him, he will teach and he will guide. The Bible gives the promise, I would that all could realize the possibilities and the probabilities there are for all who make Christ their sufficiency. It says, and their trust. The life hid with Christ in God ever has a refuge. He can say, say it with me, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So let us ask the Lord to help us to give us the wisdom not to jump out rashly and just to you know leave everything behind that's not what we are condoning or encouraging but to trust that God has a perfect plan for your life just like we looked at in the beginning with Hebrews chapter 11 remember if without faith it's impossible to please God for he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if we will diligently seek him, he will reward us with what he knows will bring us true happiness. And so let's follow his plan for our lives. Will you, if you would like to commit to seeking the Lord in his plan for the place where your family will be able to develop the most, will you stand with me as we close in prayer? Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have not left us ignorant as to the way for us to have happiness and peace, health and enjoyment in this life. That you desire for us to be in fullness of health physically, spiritually and mentally and that our characters can be developed like yours, a perfect character of love. And Father, we've learned here that there are some principles, some four key points of where it is the best place for our families to do this. And we don't know the case of each and every one, the, the mission that you have for each family, but we know that it is to develop your character in them. So wherever it may be best, Father, we are standing and saying, Lord, guide us. We want to seek you. Even give us a willingness to seek you that we can be changed by beholding what it is that you would have us to behold, even Jesus Christ, your Son. Thank you for sending him that you could make this possible, the changing of our minds from the things that we think and what we know is best to giving us a new mind that we might have that thought that is higher than we can even think of. Thank you for hearing our prayer and answering it in your way and your timing for each family here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.